To most players, Shenmue 3 is a bad game. This is not lost on series producer Yu Suzuki, who admits that letting fans have too much input doomed its sales. And now, he says that if there's ever a part four, he'll essentially ignore them. Good morning, good Wednesday morning to you. I'm Shane Satterfield from Sifted, and this is Good Morning Gaming for May 4th, 2022. If you'd prefer to consume the show the way it's intended, in a podcast feed so you can listen on your phone as you get ready for work or drive on your commute, head to patreon.com slash sifted and pledge at $4 or more per month. It's free on our YouTube channel for everyone else, but you're going to watch some ads. You can find a four days delayed feed of our flagship show, Game Face, by searching your favorite podcast service. Please give the show a review if you can. So according to Shenmue series producer Yu Suzuki, there are currently no concrete plans for Shenmue 4. In a recent interview with IGN Japan at a special event to celebrate Shenmue in Yokosuka, the city where the series is based, Suzuki essentially blamed fans for the game's poor reception from both consumers and critics, claiming the focus on fan service in Shenmue 3 made it difficult for newcomers to appreciate, and that if another game happens, he would want to make it more accessible. Suzuki is quoted as saying, With Shenmue 3, I really responded to the fans' voices, so I wasn't necessarily thinking about making any money. But since I'm running a company, I have to think about what can sell if I continue. I've been seriously talking about it over and over again. Shenmue 3 sold horribly, and it's surprising that he's considering making another one, but not surprising that he's not going to listen to fans if he does. I normally hate the phrase, stay in your lane. But with video game development, I fully believe that it's best to mostly ignore fans if the product is inherently niche. Shenmue was never a big seller, but Shenmue 3 is kind of an exception because it's a kickstarted game where its development is paid entirely by donations from hardcore fans. So, if Yu Suzuki and his team are paid in full by fans, it makes sense to make the game they're asking for. But there's no ignoring the fact that what they asked for was a bad video game that sold less than 18,000 copies its opening week in Europe. Looking at the wall of perfect 10 user scores on Metacritic, which are absolutely absurd, it appears that fans got what they wanted, but I wonder how many will line up to buy part four if it costs 60 bucks. To me, a non-delusional fan of the first two Dreamcast games, Shenmue 3 is a travesty. I barely made it past the first handful of hours before I had to stop. It's objectively a poorly constructed game from just about every perspective. It's Video game junk food, a quick fix for fans that doesn't provide much sustenance or long-term prospects. And worst of all, because of its awful reception from consumers, there may never be another. So while fans got their fantasy and were able to experience something they never thought they would and they fell backwards in their chairs and convinced themselves that the game was awesome, it would have been better if the game were constructed for modern times while still incorporating the Shenmue aesthetic a foundation to build upon for years and hopefully entries to come. But is that going to happen now? So fans get their fix at the expense of the future of the franchise, which I don't think is worth the trade-off at all. And now for a couple more stories from the top of your sifts. Ubisoft Montreal has taken over development of the Prince of Persia The Sands of Time remake. It was previously under development at Ubisoft Mumbai, Ubisoft Montreal is the studio responsible for the original Sands of Time trilogy. One can only assume that development was not going along smoothly. It was officially announced in September of 2020, and we haven't seen hide nor hair of it since. A couple delays were announced, and then this. Our guess is we won't be playing it until 2024. It was originally announced for PS4 and Xbox One, but we're also guessing that will now change. Upcoming animated Netflix series Sonic Prime was shown for the first time today. The CG series was announced last February, but we got the first look at show footage in a short teaser trailer that shows the Blue Hedgehog collecting his trademark rings. It's slated to launch on the popular subscription service before the end of 2022. An investor document has revealed previously unknown information regarding Everywhere, the new open world game from former Grand Theft Auto producer Leslie Benzies. His new studio, Build a Rocket Boy, has been working on a new open world game and the report describes it as, quote, 
real life Ready Player One, and an open world AAA game with a multiplayer experience incorporating a multi chapter epic narrative, user generated content through a virtual sandbox where players can create their own worlds, and deep social and streaming integrations. End quote. A brief plot teaser reads In the near future, technology has brought humanity to the precipice of a world shifting change. There are those who want to use this technology to advantage only themselves and those who want to use it to help all mankind. Will we look to the stars or stare only at our feet? Will we be inspired or live in fear? There's a war between good and evil in the hearts of men and women. Everything is changing and there's no going back. It's a game. It's a community. It's a new world. The storm is on the horizon and it is only the beginning of everywhere. Honestly, it sounds like the plot behind the popular Netflix film, Don't Look Up. <laughs> Leslie Benzies was integral to the tone and design of Grand Theft Auto, so definitely put this one on your radar. You can follow the game on Sifted by clicking the gear next to its title on its game page. At that point, all new coverage will appear at the top of your Sift until you turn it off. Intel boss Pat Gelsinger says the global chip shortage will last into 2024. This is not what we wanted to hear. According to Gelsinger, the shortage is also affecting production of the parts that are needed to produce the chips. So even once the parts become available again, the production ramp up is going to be slow. All this means that finding yourself a PS5, Xbox Series console, or a new graphics card for your PC is going to prove to be a challenge for a long time to come. Sucks. Warcraft Arclight Rumble was unveiled today, but don't get too excited. It's a mobile game and essentially Clash of Clans doused in Warcraft juice. It's an action strategy game where you collect over 60 semi-recognizable characters from the Warcraft universe while playing nine different modes spanning single player, cooperative, and competitive. It's set to launch for iOS and Android later this year and a closed beta is coming up soon that you can sign up for right now. According to Reggie fils -Aimé's new book, Disrupting the Game, he fought for Wii Sports to be packed in with the Nintendo Wii at launch in North America. He also claims that Miyamoto was not happy with the idea. And if you remember, Wii Sports was sold separately in Japan. It was not packed in. However, Reggie was right. <laughs> Wii Sports made the Wii a phenomenon. Reggie also claims that Miyamoto offered Wii Play as a compromise, but Reggie dug in his heels and countered with packing in a Wii remote with the minigame collection instead. Wii Play also sold exceptionally well. According to Reggie, Miyamoto said, quote, neither of you understands the challenges of creating software that people love to play. This is something we constantly push ourselves to do. We do not give away our software, end quote. And then they did, and the rest is history. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll tackle today's boss fight. Welcome to today's boss fight, where I tackle topics that may or may not be related to video games. A FIFA 22 crossplay test has been announced for PS5, Xbox Series, and Stadia. The test is coming in the near future and will be limited to the next gen versions of EA's Soccer Sim and just in time for it to debut on PlayStation Plus and Game Pass. The test will also be limited to friendlies and online seasons. It will not include Ultimate Team, at least initially. Almost all of this is great news, but for some reason, we just assumed that this was already a thing. What has taken EA so long to get this working? It's a no-brainer. It's easy to be an adult and not understand what the big deal is with crossplay. I myself really don't have much of a need for it, but I do have plenty of nieces and nephews that show me otherwise. Like most large families, I have members who are rich, some who are poor, and the bulk of them somewhere in between. So some of them have all three consoles, some have one console and a Switch, and some have just one. When they all get together at the holidays, it can be awkward for the kids who only have one console to not be able to play big games with the rest of the family. Crossplay solves this. Fortnite is not a problem. 
All of them can play together regardless of how many consoles their family can afford. It improves the accessibility of games dramatically. You might stop playing a game entirely without an online friend to play with. Making every friend accessible to you, even if they're playing on a different platform, is a gigantic step up for everyone's user experience. From a personal perspective, I also appreciate how it essentially diffuses the console wars rhetoric. All the discussions, clicks, and other nonsense that circle the drain in school cafeterias or on social media are essentially rendered moot when everyone can play together regardless of which platform they've chosen or been given. It's a far cry from choosing between Sonic or Mario when I was a kid and having to live with the consequences of your decisions. Crossplay also drastically improves the experience for everyone involved. It has a direct and meaningful impact on matchmaking speed and quality for online games. The more people in the player pool, the more likely you're going to be matched up with people in your area, which will generally lower latency and lag. Another added bonus is being able to play on multiple platforms by yourself. To be fair, Epic Games claims that just 18% of Fortnite players have played on more than one platform, but it's really the ability to play on the go on mobile or Switch and then return home to pick up your progress where you left off on another platform that is one of the best features for people like me. Also, 60% of Fortnite players have played against players on other platforms, which resulted in a 570% increase in player engagement, which resulted in an extra 90 minutes of play per day. Now, some people may not be happy about that. Parents, teachers maybe. And of course, that results in increased monetization and companies like Epic getting paid so they can keep making awesome games. Crossplay is also a way to keep games alive that would have been killed in the past. A lot of times, when player bases shrink, there aren't enough on each platform to keep a game viable. But now a game can have limited success and still have enough players to make the game worth improving and possibly turning it into something awesome. Really, we need to thank Epic Games, especially for the proliferation of crossplay. If it hadn't done it with Fortnite and provided rungs of data to prove it's the right thing to do, reluctant partners like PlayStation never would have changed their minds. So, as you go forward playing games in your life, keep in mind that not everything has to be made for you, and crossplay might be one of them. But it's become a vital tool in increasing engagement, monetization, and really just perpetuating good vibes between players from different ecosystems when in the past there would only be friction. I just know that every holiday season, when I see all my young relatives sharing war stories about their cooperative conquests or competitive shootouts, it reminds me how things can be irrelevant for some and absolutely essential for others. Thanks for listening to Good Morning Gaming. I appreciate every single one of you who listens to GMG. I'm Shane Satterfield. Follow me on Twitter at Dinfire and follow Sifted at Sifted Games. And while you're on the interwebs, head to patreon.com slash sifted and drop us a pledge. The show will be back tomorrow, but until then, seize today because there will never be another. <laughs>